Hello and welcome to today's video. Today we're going to be talking about superfoods. We're going to be doing a tier list and I'm going to go over approximately my 30 favorite foods but also some tricky ones added in there that are considered superfoods and they're actually going to go in the bottom of the list so this is going to be a bit of a controversial video i'll be interested to see if there are any foods that you think should be on this list that aren't if i miss anything out make sure you let me know and if i put one of the foods that you think is a superfood at the bottom of this list and you think it deserves to be higher up on this list i want you to let me know why it should be higher up so let's get started Okay, here we are. So I'm just going to go over all of these superfoods that we have down here, just so you know what they are. Apple cider vinegar, avocados, blueberries, sprouts, beans, butter, chlorella and spirulina, chia seeds, garlic, coconut oil, beetroot, liver, olive oil, medicinal mushrooms, oily fish, flax seeds, seaweed, red meat, natto, spinach, salmon, cacao, fresh green herbs, kale, tomatoes, turmeric, matcha green tea, raw honey, ginger, eggs, caviar, and kefir. So as you can see, we've got a fantastic lineup of different foods that we are going to judge, we're going to compare, and I'm gonna pick these foods apart and help you figure out what truly deserves to be called a superfood. I want to start with a controversial one. Maybe controversial, maybe not. We're going to take spinach. It's going straight in D tier. Spinach, I don't hate it, okay? I don't hate spinach, but it's not a superfood. It's not good enough to just be a green leafy vegetable that grows out of the ground and think you're going to be considered a superfood. And spinach is definitely not it. The thing about spinach is it honestly doesn't really contain that many nutrients. There are no real special or unique substances that you only get in spinach that have massively health promoting benefits. And the thing about spinach is, it's probably the highest dietary source of oxalate of any food you could possibly eat. Now there's quite a lot of oxalates in some of these other foods, like potentially beetroots and cacao. But the thing is, these other foods actually do have some, some benefits, whereas spinach, literally nothing. Personally, I very rarely eat spinach, and if I was gonna eat it, I would only ever eat it cooked. Cooking breaks down some of those oxalates. If you're putting spinach in your juices, in your smoothies, I probably would just straight up avoid it. If you really love the taste, like enjoy it for the sake of enjoying the taste. If you're some crazy person that does actually like spinach. But if you're eating it for the health benefits, literally throw it away, don't even eat it, not worth it. I think as we've started with spinach, it would be a really nice one to next go on to kale. And I'm gonna put kale in C tier. So kale is slightly higher in nutrients and significantly lower in oxalates it's still not really that good. You know, when, when I'm thinking about superfood, I want something phenomenal. I don't just want something that like has some nutrients in it. It's not bad. It's definitely better than spinach. But honestly, if we're talking superfoods, I wouldn't even really put it on this list. As far as this tier list goes, C and D tier, I personally don't even really consider superfoods. When we're looking at superfoods, these are things that I'm going to be putting in S and A tier. And B tier is maybe it could situationally be considered a superfood. Personally, I don't think kale and spinach even deserve to be here. So now that we've got some of these green leafy veggies out of the way, you know, everyone says you've got to eat your five a day, you've got to eat your green leafy veggies. Again, they're not the worst thing. They're definitely not superfoods. Let's look at something that is a superfood. Now, this is probably going to surprise you. You might not be thinking that this is going to go where I'm going to put it. But I'm actually going to put beef in A tier. So my thought process behind this is, beef is actually really high in nutrients, and it doesn't have to be steak, like you can see in this picture here. Any kind of beef, with the exception of organ meats, is what we're talking about here. So this is beef mince, this is steak, this is all different kinds of meat that you get that aren't organ meats. And I suppose this would, in a way, kind of include all ruminant meat. So this would also include, let's say, lamb and maybe even goat as well. But specifically here, I'm talking about beef. And ideally, you really do want to get grass-fed beef if you can. But if you can't, you know, I know that there's a lot of debate and conversation on the internet about, oh, you have to eat things that are grass-fed, you have to eat organic, and you should, as you're able to. The thing about animal products is animals have their own detoxification systems. And also, the way that animals digest their food, so cows in particular, they have four stomachs. That's a lot of microbes working for them. Microbes themselves are very powerful players in the detoxification game. 
if you think about toxins in the human body but also outside you know if you look at wastewater treatment plants sewage treatment plants they're treating these things with bacteria because bacteria break things down if you're an animal and you're using fermentation to get the majority of your food so for example a cow eats grass or eats grain there's very little calories in that but what's actually happening is the bacteria in the gut of the cow are breaking these things down and producing short chain fatty acids like butyrate so i know this is like a crazy thing to think you've probably never heard anyone say this before but cows actually eat a ketogenic diet the reason being all of this fiber that they're eating is breaking down into fats in their gut and they're absorbing these fats and that's their fuel source so you've probably never heard that but cows eat a ketogenic diet and this is even true if they eat grains even though grains have a higher carbohydrate content the cows don't break those sugars down and absorb them as sugars they ferment in the digestive system and produce short chain fatty acids so if you can get grass fed and organic and this like premium quality stuff great then you should do that but if you can't even still because the way that the animal works because the way that the animal extracts nutrients from the food and the fact that animals can detoxify compounds meat has to go really high on this list and this doesn't even begin to touch on several other things including like the nutrient density if you compare the amount of nutrients in let's take 100 grams of steak and compare it to 100 grams of spinach not only do you have significantly higher numbers of nutrients in the steak of almost all nutrients in, even including the ones that they tell you about like the calcium and the iron you know a lot of these nutrients are actually not bioavailable your body can't do anything with them because there are compounds in the plants that bind those nutrients in your gut and they're excreted in your stool you never even absorb them whereas animal products have no anti-nutrients whatsoever animal products don't need anti-nutrients because animals have legs and they can run away from predators but plants can't so the nutrients that you find in an animal product are a hundred percent bioavailable whereas in plant products they're generally not and you're probably going to see there's some level of theme to that in this list today almost always animal products are going to be being rated higher than plant products for this simple reason they have more nutrients in a more bioavailable format and less potentially harmful substances i really think animal products are super underrated and that's again one reason i wanted to do the tier list is for you to see like you eating of some good quality meat is tiers and tiers above eating your healthy greens your kale and your spinach there's so many different foods here i'm not sure what to pick so i'm actually just going to wiggle my mouse and pick one at random and then we're going to go with that one so now we've got we've got raw honey oh i think this one's got to be pretty high i think this one's going in a tier again as well so the thought process behind this as far as dietary carbohydrate content goes it's really hard to get something that's more nutrient dense than honey especially if it's raw honey it's really important that it's raw and that it's unfiltered because when you have honey that is raw and unfiltered and especially if you can get it locally as well there are added benefits if you can get honey locally especially if you have any allergy symptoms allergic rhinitis autoimmunity there are compounds in honey that sourced locally that can help your immune system to modulate itself so it can reduce these autoimmune or environmental allergy symptoms when you go into nature and you look at the availability of sweet things really you're left with seasonal fruit which is like maybe let's say like a six out of ten on the sweet scale and then honey which is like a ten out of ten honey is the sweetest natural thing that you can find and the benefits of honey go far beyond just eating them you can use honey on wounds you can use honey to preserve foods you can use honey to even make like alcoholic drinks you can make mead mead is made with honey and for me personally honey is my preferred way of sweetening things so instead of using something like refined sugar or even a more healthy option like let's say uh, an unrefined coconut sugar the raw honey is far 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 beyond that in its natural state it contains vitamins and minerals and especially some of these little trace minerals that are really important with the blood sugar regulation if i'm ever adding sweetness to something it's always with honey and preferably raw and local honey when i can get it next on this list we're going to go and we're going to do chlorella and spirulina so i've grouped these together because they're very similar they're basically they're basically pond scum so they are they're basically like a micro algae that grows on the top of bodies of water and i believe the place where this was consumed a lot was in ancient mayan civilizations i think that we're going to be putting this in b tier 
because even though from a nourishment perspective, I still don't think it's that good. Again, plant food does have certain anti-nutrients, but because it's a microalgae, it's, I believe it's single celled or it's very, very small. It's a very small organism. It has less of those anti-nutrients. It's also a really good source of chlorophyll. But the main reason that I would consider it bordering on a superfood is the fact that it actually works really well as a chelator for heavy metals in the body. So the most common use for chlorella and spirulina is actually for heavy metal detoxification, especially things like mercury. And consequently, one of the most common reactions that I see with people trying chlorella and spirulina is that when they take them, sometimes they can get really severe headaches and even have other types of die-off or Huxheimer sort of symptoms. So this is because it's stimulating the body to do quite a profound detoxification process. So for this reason, the fact that it does work really well at mobilizing certain heavy metals, I do believe that it should be considered a superfood. It definitely deserves a place above kale and spinach, but I would be hesitant to put it up in A tier alongside the red meat and the honey. If I personally had heavy metal toxicity, and this is something that worked for me, I would maybe be considering putting it in A tier. This isn't really something I've had to deal with. So for that reason, we're gonna leave it in B tier. I just noticed that we've got something in all of the columns, but we don't have one in S tier yet. So I wanted to just take the easiest one on this list and just put it in S tier just so that we can put something in there. So that's gonna be liver. Liver is up in S tier. Now, before I go in and explain to you why I'm putting liver in S tier, I want you to leave me a little comment below. Let me know, do you like liver? Because I know a lot of people really don't like it. I personally don't really like the taste. The only way that I've found that I can eat liver on a sustainable basis is in pate. So pate is kind of like a, I suppose it's like a meat paste that you usually would have on toast. I personally really like pate. It makes it very easy to eat liver in my diet. But let me know, do you like liver? Is that something that you like to eat? Is it something that you, I know people that are just absolutely disgusted at the thought of even eating an organ, let alone the taste of how liver can taste. So let me know, where do you sit on this scale? Do you love it? Do you hate it? And if you're one of these people that hates it, but you found a way to get it into your diet, let us know how you did that. Because that could be really helpful for somebody else that's watching. And maybe for me as well. I should probably have a little bit more liver in my diet. So the reason that we're putting liver up in S tier is as far as nutrient density around foods is concerned, you cannot beat liver. If you take, let's say red meat, as actually being a very good source of bioavailable nutrients. Liver literally has about 10 times more nutrients for the same serving size. This might feel like an over-exaggeration, but it's not. And I really want to make the point that if you took every single food on this tier list, apart from liver, and combined them together, they would have less nutrients than liver. So I'm not saying that liver has more than every single one on this list. I'm saying liver has more nutrients than every single other thing on this list combined and I think with that being at the forefront of your mind it shouldn't be hard to realize why liver deserves its place in S tier. It is the single best way to address almost any nutritional deficiency. If you have anemia liver can help. If you have deficiency of any B complex vitamin liver can help. If you're struggling with low energy liver can help. If you're struggling to detox if you have liver congestion if you have a mental health problem liver can probably help. If there's one single takeaway that you get from this video, it is that you should probably be including liver. And you don't even have to eat it every day. Even one or two portions of liver once a week is, again, probably you'll get more nutrients in that one meal than in all the rest of the food that you consume in that week combined. It is truly challenging to understand how superior liver is with regards to nutrient density compared to basically every single other food on planet Earth. So the main little things that you need to know about liver is that first of all, you really wanna try and get as good quality as you can. If you can't afford grass-fed meat generally, I still would really try and push you to get grass-fed liver. The first reason is that it tastes a lot better. The liver is what processes and filters toxins. So if you're eating the liver of a healthy animal, it's gonna taste a lot better. It's not where toxins are stored. So it's not really so much that the liver is going to have more toxins that's not really how it works. Most toxins are fat soluble and therefore are stored in fat, but we're gonna to come to that a little bit later on. But a less healthy animal is gonna have less nutrients in its liver. So to get the maximum benefit, we really want grass-fed and organic liver. It doesn't really matter what you eat, if it's from cows, if it's beef liver, if it's pork liver, if it's chicken liver, 
honestly doesn't really matter the only thing that really matters is the quality of the animal so do the best you can with what you've got next on the list here we're going to do we're going to do salmon so this is this is actually a picture of sockeye salmon you can tell by how red it is and i kind of already showed you where it's going it's going up here in a tier salmon is absolutely amazing that red color that you can see in all salmons but especially in the sockeye salmon is actually coming from a compound called astaxanthin this is something that a lot of people actually supplement with for the antioxidant benefits but the place we get it is it's in microalgae, and then it's consumed by krill and other small organisms and then bigger fish like salmon eat these and other smaller fish that have also been eating them and then this red pigment continues to be concentrated and concentrates to the point where it actually changes the color of their flesh it's almost the same way as if you were to eat a bunch of carrots if you just kept eating carrots and carrots and carrots you would build up so many carotenoids in your body that you, your skin actually starts to turn orange it's the same kind of thing they eat so many of these things in their natural diet that they literally turn red but the reason that it deserves its place up here in a tier is that you've got first of all really nice macros you've got lots of really high quality protein You've got lots of really good fats, especially the omega-3s that really count. I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about omega-3s when we come to the flax seeds and the other oily fish. But just covering it lightly now, salmon, absolutely amazing source of the, the good omega-3s that you really want. You might be thinking, why only A tier? Why didn't you put it in S tier? The thing is, as far as oily fish go, salmon is starting to get quite big. And as the fish get bigger, the amount of heavy metals that they have inside of them begins to accumulate. So the bigger the fish and the more predatory and carnivorous the fish is, the larger amount of metals that begin to bioaccumulate. So salmon is still small enough that I wouldn't avoid it or I wouldn't even consider reducing it. The ones you want to be careful with are things like swordfish and tuna. They're so big that they really are starting to bioaccumulate a significant amount of metals. Very interesting, actually, I discovered that the tuna are beginning to adapt to the amount of mercury in the waters, and they're beginning to increase a compound in their body called selenomethionine, which is basically a mercury protective agent. If you've done anything with heavy metal detox, you'll know that selenium is a really important part of mercury detoxification. And these fish are showing you that this is true, because they are naturally, biologically beginning to adapt to this increased levels of mercury in their environment by increasing the amount of selenomethionine that they have in circulation. So they're basically, in a way, kind of like immune to the mercury, but we're not. And if we eat them, that's gonna affect us. So that's the only reason that salmon didn't go up in S tier. And for the observant among you, you're probably gonna realize that down here, we've got other oily fish. So this is things like mackerel and sardines. These have all of the benefits of the salmon, but they have none of the same risks that with, with regards to the heavy metals. So can you guess where they're going to go? They have to go above. Other oily fish, this is smaller oily fish, mackerel, sardines, anchovies, they have to go up in S tier. They're the single best source of dietary omega-3s, just the same as salmon, but with lower toxicity levels. Also, they're generally significantly more affordable. I don't know where you're living right now, but I've lived in Europe, I've lived in Asia, I've traveled around a lot. And almost always, wild salmon is two to four times more expensive than wild small fish that's locally caught and just one final thing before we finish up on talking about oily fish these fish have to be wild caught if these are fish that have been farmed and you really need to be careful with this you have to check with the fishmonger or you have to check the back of the packet make sure that it is wild caught if it is farmed it would not even be d tier farmed fish is so toxic they're literally swimming around in their own feces. They're fed things like genetically modified soy, which completely messes up their omega-3 to 6 ratio. So you lose all of those omega benefits. They're constantly given antibiotics because fish can't thrive in such a confined environment. Farmed fish are absolutely toxic. They're terrible for the environment and they're terrible for you. I would not even eat them. Avoid them at all costs. But if you're getting wild caught fish, A tier, S tier, depending on the size. The bigger it is, the more toxins that it's going to bioaccumulate. The smaller it is, the safer it's going to be. Next on this list, we're going to look at natto. So natto is basically fermented soybeans. They are really popular in Asian countries, especially Japan and Korea. And you can see here in this little picture that we've got, I'll put it down so you can see, they actually even serve this as like fast food. You can go to most convenience stores or supermarkets, buy a little plastic container 
with fermented soybeans in it. Now, you might be thinking, soybeans, that's not going to be very high on this list. Soy is generally not a very good food. And, and you're right. If we were looking at any soy product other than natto, it would be down in D tier. Soy has a lot of phytoestrogens, and unless it is prepared properly, I would not consume it at all. I would avoid soy milk. I would avoid soy baby formula preparations. I would avoid soy protein. I would just completely avoid soy. Very inflammatory, generally not very good for most people. And if you look at the cultures where soy is a big part of the diet, they all eat it after it's been fermented and processed correctly. They don't make milk out of it. They don't eat it raw. They know that it needs to be processed to be a healthy food. So if it was any other type of soy, it would be in D tier. This might surprise you. Natto is actually going in A tier. The reason natto is going up here is it contains certain probiotic organisms that you don't get really in any other food. And these are the soil-based organisms, the bacillus subspecies. Now, I believe it depends a little bit on how they're fermented and where you go in the world. But generally, I believe we're looking at bacillus subtilis and bacillus coagulans. And these are some really powerful spore-based organisms. They're able to produce a very powerful enzyme called natokinase. And this has a whole host of different health benefits. Asian countries are notoriously looked at as being healthy and having long lives, especially if you look at places like Japan. And I think that a really big part of it is the fact that fermented soy is generally consumed by every single person at least once per day. So whilst this might not be the most practical food for you to get depending on where you live, just know that this is a really powerful food and that soy isn't always bad if it is prepared correctly. Next, we're moving on to blueberries. And I actually have blueberries here. As a placeholder, I'm going to say for every kind of berry and currant. So let's include goji berries. Let's include red currants and black currants. Let's include blackberries and raspberries. We're going to look at all different berries. But I thought blueberries, they're generally probably the most common. So I would put all berries collectively, but especially blueberries, in B tier. I definitely don't think they deserve a place in true superfood territory. They're not bad foods at all. As you can see, well above spinach and at least above kale. We're on par with spirulina chlorella, which is definitely powerful contextually. But the things that make berries really powerful, first of all, is the variety. The main strength with regards to this list as to why I'm putting it in B tier are the polyphenol content of berries. And the more varieties of berries you have, the more polyphenols you're going to get. So if you're able to include and enjoy a variety of different types of berries, you're going to get even more amplified benefits. Polyphenols work in your body as potent microbiome modulators, so they're going to influence the composition of your microbiome. They feed specific bugs and kill other specific bugs. They also work as antioxidants inside of your body. And different antioxidants have affinities for different types of toxic chemicals. One of the sad things about berries, though, is that unless you're getting them wild, which is extremely expensive, Organic, which is also tends to be quite expensive, they are one of the most heavily pesticide sprayed crops. So it's really important that when you are getting berries, you do get as high quality as you can. And this is true of all berries. So even if you're only able to consume them in small quantities, try to get as much variety, you know, go from one different type of berry to the next the next week. And also, even if it is just a small quantity, try to get at a really good quality. Now I'm looking at these and I kind of want to do ginger and turmeric at the same time. The thing is, I'm, I'm a bit stuck. I don't know where I want to put them. I think what I'm going to do, in my mind, I, I'm already thinking turmeric is better than is better than ginger. It's not, again, it's not that ginger's bad, but turmeric is better. So I'm going to position one and it's going to help me position the other one. So I, I actually think that turmeric deserves a spot in A tier next to natto. Now the, the reason for this is, some of the compounds in turmeric... And I'm actually such a massive nerd that I memorized some of these off by heart. So some of the compounds in turmeric are, believe it or not, this is crazy, tumorones. That's the name of one of the polyphenols in there that makes it have the health benefits that it does. And one of the other compounds in there is curcumin. And the compound of the polyphenol in that is called curcuminoids. So you've got your turmeric with your tumorones and your curcuminoids. And these compounds and a whole bunch of other ones in there that probably haven't been very well studied yet have extremely potent anti-inflammatory properties. I've personally had periods of time in my life where I was dealing with some serious chronic pain and conventional painkillers was simply not an option. My body did not tolerate medication. And I was able to create a tea using ginger and turmeric 
and it would bring my pain down from a nine out of 10. So this was literally laying there with my eyes closed, just trying to stay alive, down to around a six, which is still horrible. You know, living your life in a six out of 10 pain state is awful. But going from a nine to a six in the span of 30 minutes after having a tea is an absolutely crazy experience. So I know the power of these substances. I do think that ginger is slightly less powerful. So I'm gonna put it down here in B tier but it is still a phenomenal thing. And I consume this almost every single day. Ginger is amazing for your digestion. It really supports the motility. It supports the stomach to produce acid. It acts as a digestive bitter. It helps the liver. There's basically not a single part of your digestive system that doesn't benefit from you consuming ginger. I, I really am quite torn and I, I have such a fondness with ginger that I, would, I really wanna put it up here next to turmeric, but I, I just don't think I can when I look at the other things it's compared to, but I would say turmeric definitely deserves its place up here in A tier. As far as I'm concerned, these two are definitely superfoods. Turmeric doesn't even have to fight for its place. Ginger is fighting a little bit, but I still love it. Ginger, absolutely amazing. Combine the two together, absolutely phenomenal combination. They're actually a part of the same family, which is why they kind of look the same. And the way that you prepare them, you know, how you remove the skin is kind of similar. If you can get fresh, ginger and turmeric is definitely better than the powder. But maybe I've just got a little bit snobby over the years. You know, some people are like coffee snobs and they like their coffee just the perfect way. Maybe I'm a bit the same with the herbs. But I really do think you can feel the difference. You can taste the difference when you have fresh herbs versus dried herbs. So, yeah, I feel confident with the positioning there. Turmeric, A tier. Ginger, B tier. Definitely still a superfood. I think it's about time that we dive into another controversial one. So I'm gonna take flax seeds and I'm gonna stick them in D tier. Now, I know what you're thinking, right? Well, there's probably two groups of people. First group, let me know which one you're in. Flax seeds, they're not really that good for the reasons I'm about to describe. Second group, oh, but flax seeds, they're really high in omega-3s. They're a really good source of fiber. Or what about the oil? Why don't we have flaxseed oil? That's a really good source of omega-3s as well. Wrong. That's where you're actually wrong. And I'm gonna help you understand why. So first of all, if you eat the seeds themselves, all seeds are very high in anti-nutrients. They contain things like lectins and phytic acid and oxalates. And you have to think about nuts and seeds and even things like beans and legumes. These are children of plants. If say kale and spinach have some anti-nutrients in, can you imagine how many more anti-nutrients are gonna be in the offspring of these plants? These are the things that they don't want to be eaten. These are things that they want you to learn. If you eat them, you get a stomach ache and then you don't eat them anymore because these are their offspring. They're trying to protect them. They also contain a lot of different types of enzyme inhibitors, one of them being phytic acid. And the thing about enzyme inhibitors is that one, they actually inhibit your digestive enzymes. So if you eat a bunch of enzyme inhibiting containing foods, the enzyme inhibitors in the food, let's say the flax seeds in this case, will deactivate those enzymes. And the thing about enzymes is they're supposed to work multiple times. They're catalysts. So they speed up a reaction, but they're not consumed in the process. So one molecule of, for example, amylase could break down 100, 1,000, 10,000 molecules of starch. But if it becomes inhibited by an enzyme inhibitor, it doesn't break down any. So not only do you not digest the seeds that you've eaten, but you also become unable to digest all of the other nutrients in all of the other foods that you consumed with them. That's the enzyme inhibitor part, but there's also the anti-nutrient part. These other compounds like oxalates, for example, if you consume, let's say we take, let's take liver. So we take, we consume hundred grams of liver alone in one meal. And then in another meal, we consume hundred grams of liver, but we consume it with 10 grams of flax seeds some of the substances in the flax seeds will bind with the nutrients that are in the liver and stop you being able to absorb them. It actually reduces the nutrient content of the other foods that you consume with it in that meal. So not only does it provide you very little to no nutritional benefit, it actually steals the nutrients out of the other foods that you ate with it. Now, this doesn't mean that nuts and seeds and beans and legumes can never be consumed because down here we've got sprouted seeds and we've got beans and one of these is going to be up here at least in a tier maybe even s tier i haven't actually decided yet but two of the these two are at least going in b tier or above so it's not that you can never consume nuts seeds beans and legumes 
but just looking at flax seeds like this like completely unprocessed just whole seeds definitely not a superfood probably not even passable as a standard food i would put them below what an average food should be so then you're saying what if we eat the oil instead why don't we have flaxseed oil instead of flax seeds then we're going to get all of the benefits of omega-3s again wrong that's not how it works the omega-3s that you get in flax seeds are linoleic acid lna although this is an omega-3 and it can balance your omega-3 to 6 ratio and it does have some anti-inflammatory effect in the body the type of omega-3 that really makes a difference in your body are the epa and dha omega-3 fatty acids and your body can convert some of the lna but it's about a 10 percent conversion from lna to epa and then about a 10 percent conversion again from epa to dha so if you needed 100 units of dha you could either consume 100 units of DHA from fish, or you could consume 1,000 units of EPA from, say, fish, or you could consume 10,000 units of LNA from flax seeds. Then your body has to convert it and then convert it again. And the thing is, the absorption rate is not very high. And all of these numbers are assuming you are optimally healthy. If you have any kind of microbiome dysbiosis, gut health problems, liver congestion, if you have anything less than optimal health your absorption and conversion rates are going to be even lower so the fact that flax seeds are promoted as a health food as a superfood is a disgrace they should not even be on this list they deserve their spot in detail with spinach not a superfood now i think it's probably nice to get chia seeds out of the way as well considering a lot of people put chia seeds and flax seeds in the same camp i'm going to say flax seeds are definitely worse than chia seeds so by deduction chia seeds are going one above definitely wouldn't consider them a superfood it's really important when you consume chia seeds that you soak them in something first because they absorb a lot of water and they expand a lot so one of the best ways you can do this is dissolve it in some coconut milk or some yogurt or something that's very high in liquid and allow them to to bulk out but again it's a seed it does have anti-nutrients the omega-3s it provides not the right form it's not generally a very a very good food it is a decent source of fiber if fiber is something that you're looking for but i don't think it's fair to call a food a superfood just because it's high in fiber i mean literally every single plant has fiber in so it's definitely not going to get put very high on the list for that reason alone but i will say i don't think they're as bad as flax seeds so we'll leave them at c tier now whilst we're kind of on this in this kind of tirade energy about these things i want to take these sprouts so in this case these sprouts you don't know this because you can't really see it's very small and even if you could see you wouldn't really know unless you're a gardener or you grow your own sprouts at home which is probably unlikely these are broccoli sprouts and broccoli sprouts definitely deserve a spot in s tier so this is what i'm saying there's nuance to this it's not that seeds are bad it's that if you're trying to take flax seeds for omega-3 that's completely pointless it doesn't make any sense it shows that you don't understand the biochemistry and you don't understand what the body actually needs from food and how it gets it from food but if we look at sprouts we look at broccoli sprouts these unquestionably deserve a place in s tier when you take something and you soak it and you sprout it not only do you break down all of those enzyme inhibitors those enzyme inhibitors are there to protect the food to protect the nut or the seed from things eating it but they're also there because they stop the nut or the seed from growing before it's in fertile soil so what tends to happen is when the seed reaches fertile soil the enzyme inhibitors begin to leach out into the water around it and this is one way we can improve the nutrient content and reduce the harmful substances in nuts and seeds that's to soak them if you take certain foods like for example kidney beans kidney beans are actually toxic if you eat them raw but if you soak them in water overnight for 24 hours you can cook them and eat them many of those harmful substances are removed in the water and if we take it one step further if we begin to sprout them not only have we reduced the enzyme inhibitor content below a threshold where it's able to start to grow but it actually begins to sprout and to grow and it produces its own enzymes as it begins to do this because it's now a living food it's become activated and therefore not only does it not have the negative substances but many of the vitamins and minerals become more bioavailable so from a plant foods perspective you really can't get a food that is more nourishing than a sprout because a sprout has 
basically just started to be alive, it has a very high concentration of nutrients. The same way if you were to imagine looking at an egg, and we do have eggs here on the list. We've got actual regular eggs. We've got caviar, which are fish eggs. We're going to look at these again in a minute. But if you think about a nut or a seed after it's just sprouted, it's almost like an egg for plants, but with all of the anti-nutrients and all of the enzyme inhibitors removed. So we get all of the benefits and we've removed all of the negatives. But the reason that we're putting broccoli sprouts specifically, so this is true of all sprouts. If we're looking at all sprouts in general, so this could be sprouted flax seeds even. This could be sprouted chickpeas. This could be sprouted mung beans. I would say these probably deserve a spot in either A, probably B tier, probably B tier. But the reason I'm putting specifically broccoli sprouts in S tier is broccoli sprouts are really high in a compound called sulforaphane. So this is a sulfur-based antioxidant polyphenolic compound. And this substance has amazing antioxidant effects in your body. It's extremely powerful at helping the body detoxify estrogens. So if you're a man struggling with low testosterone, if you're a woman struggling with hormone imbalances from, say, PCOS, to endometriosis there's a really good likelihood that your liver could do with some support in your estrogen clearance and the thing is this is almost like an intelligent substance it's almost like an adaptogen if your body doesn't need to use it for this it will use it for something else it will use it for its amazing antioxidant potential or it will even use it as a source of sulfur it will take that sulfur molecule and use it to make glutathione or some other really important substance that your body needs but in my experience the power of sulforaphane is extremely high it works really well as a painkiller works really well to support detoxification works really well to support liver health i think it definitely deserves a spot up here i'm hesitating a little bit i'm thinking maybe it should be here instead i'm thinking maybe it should be an a tier because they are absolutely phenomenal but when we're looking at like what is it with liver and fatty fish can sprouts really be there i feel like whatever i do at this point i'm going to be unhappy it's going to be an s tier or a tier and there's going to be a part of me torn either way so I, th I think I'm actually going to leave it in S tier just because I want to emphasize animal foods are amazing and they're really underrated, but that doesn't mean that plant foods aren't also really good. And it is a solid food. I, I think sprouts are an amazing source of nutrition. And yeah, okay, they firmly deserve a spot in S tier. It's more than fair. They deserve to be there. Now we're going to take a look at garlic. And I'm thinking garlic, garlic is pretty good. I think it's probably going to go in B tier. My thought process behind this is that Garlic is a FODMAP food. So FODMAPs are substances that really feed our microbiome. They're a category of prebiotics that feed the bugs in our gut. And garlic is really high in some of these FODMAPs. But that alone isn't enough to put it in B tier. It's not enough to consider it a superfood. The reason I would consider it a superfood is that whilst it does have prebiotics, that are really good at feeding certain beneficial organisms. It actually contains some very powerful antimicrobial compounds as well, including something called allicin. That's not the only compound in there that has antimicrobial effects. There are a lot of others, but allicin is the most common or the most popular, the most well-known. So the reason that I'm saying this is I'm not a fan of antimicrobial approaches. The way this usually works is someone has SIBO or candida or parasites or some kind of dysbiotic organism present in their intestines. And what most practitioners do is they'll find some kind of really strong herb like oil of oregano or grapefruit seed extract and they'll put them on a really high dose and they'll take this herb and it will basically work like antibiotics in their gut. The thing is Killing things aggressively in the digestive system shows that you don't truly understand the intricate balance of how the microflora works. Instead of trying to brute force something, I always prefer to encourage and to nudge. And that's why when we're consuming garlic in our foods as a whole food, we're getting the prebiotic benefits, so we're selectively feeding the good, but we're getting the antimicrobial benefits because of the allicin and the other compounds, but in a realistic dose. You know, when you take a product that has allicin, or if you take oil of oregano or something like that, the amount of herb or vegetable that goes into it is extremely high. We're talking like for one drop of oil of oregano, you're looking at up to 100 grams of raw oregano leaf. Whoever eats 100 grams of oregano in one go? Nobody, because it's it tastes crazy. That's not the way these herbs and spices and vegetables and seasonings are supposed to be used. I believe that the way that food tastes and the fact that we eat food and it tastes good to us is biofeedback that says this is a healthy food. You'd never just go out and eat 
a whole clove of garlic raw. You just wouldn't. It would make your stomach hurt. You would feel terrible and it would taste disgusting. What some people do is take all of the antimicrobial compounds, put them in one little pill and take it three times a day. And it's just absolutely crazy that that's the way people go about it. And they don't, they think because it's a plant, it's a more natural version and it's not as harmful to the gut as antibiotics, but it absolutely can be. So instead, what I encourage is include these herbs, these spices in their natural forms in a way that makes your food taste better. That way you're getting the benefits. They also have plenty of different types of polyphenols and antioxidants and dozens of other beneficial substances. So incredibly powerful. I absolutely love them. Don't like the antimicrobial route, but including them in the whole food form, you get the best of both worlds. You get the holistic benefit. I think now's also probably a really good time, as I mentioned, oregano, to do green herbs. So in here, I'm including things like parsley, cilantro, coriander, rosemary, maybe even things like bay leaves. So generally, the seasonings that you use to season your food that are green. There's even things like basil and mint, thyme, things like that. I think these also deserve a spot in B tier, and it's going to be a similar kind of thing as the berries. The strength here is in the variety. If you can have a little bit of mint, and a little bit of cilantro, and a little bit of rosemary, and a little bit of basil, you're getting all of these different prebiotic, all of these different polyphenol and antioxidant benefits. The variety is the key here. They say variety is the spice of life. Well, variety is the spice of your spices as well. So the more variety that you can get, the more benefit that you're going to get. Next up, I've got two that we can sort fairly quickly. I've got beetroots. Beetroots are powerful, but they're not that powerful. I'd put them in C tier. I don't even think I'd classify them as a superfood. They can be very powerful for liver detoxification. The betaine in there can also be really powerful for stomach acid. It works really well as a digestive bitter. But honestly, it's not a superfood. You can't just say something is a superfood because it's got a cool colour. you know. And yet, you do get some really cool polyphenols in here. It, again, it's not that beetroots are bad, but they're not superfoods. They're going in C tier. About the same as kale. And by the same kind of token... We got tomatoes. I was going to put tomatoes in D tier. I really don't think tomatoes are a superfood. But seeing we've got spinach, we've got flax seeds. I feel bad putting tomatoes next to flax seeds because they're definitely better. But they can be problematic for some people. Tomatoes are nightshade vegetables. So if you have any kind of digestive problems, if you've got arthritis, if you've got any kind of autoimmunity, consider removing nightshades to see if it makes a difference. Because for some people, it's literally like a night and day difference. And this is because nightshades contain certain anti-nutrient compounds that cause some significant problems for certain individuals. So for that reason, definitely couldn't be up in B, but I feel bad putting in extra flax seeds. Solid C tier. Now we're going to do probably one of my favorite on the list. We've got eggs. Eggs straight in S tier unquestionable i always refer to eggs as nature's multivitamin you have everything in an egg that you need to make a baby chick which means you have everything in an egg that you need to make your body function the egg white is a really nice source of protein but the egg yolk is where it's at if i was going to do egg yolks and egg whites as separate things on this list egg whites would be like maybe b tier maybe c tier egg yolks s tier egg yolks do all the heavy lifting as far as eggs are concerned. Amazing source of every single nutrient that you could possibly need. They have all of your B-complex vitamins. They have all of the minerals, all of the trace minerals. Literally every single thing you need to make a baby chick. But maybe the most powerful, unique thing about eggs, especially the egg yolks, is the choline content. Choline is absolutely phenomenal. It's an extremely powerful nutrient. It's really important for detoxification. It's really important for liver and bile health. And it's also a really important part of your brain. Egg yolks are also really high in cholesterol, which is actually a significant good thing. The amount of cholesterol that you eat in your diet has literally almost no effect on your cholesterol levels. Most of your cholesterol comes from your liver. Your liver takes saturated fat and turns it into cholesterol because it needs it. Your body isn't stupid. It doesn't make things that just block the arteries for no reason. If you need more information about that, I have a whole separate video all about cholesterol you can go and look at after you finish this one. Don't go now, go afterwards. You need to see where the rest of these things are going. But cholesterol, very good for you. If you can provide it from your food, it means that your liver doesn't have to do so much work and it doesn't have to make it. So unquestionably, eggs, S tier, very easy decision. And that makes my next one very easy to do, which is caviar. Caviar being fish eggs. So if you take fish, so you take fish here and you take eggs, 
Where do you think fish eggs are going? You're absolutely right, they're going straight in S tier as well. Fish eggs basically is quite literally as simple as, think of all the benefits that I described about oily fish and all the benefits that I described about eggs and you get both of them in caviar. The only thing is kind of a bit expensive and it's a bit of a acquired or a specific taste. Only certain people like it. But from a nutritional perspective, from an overall perspective, caviar, definitely S tier. Only thing is, again, with the fish, you don't want it to be farmed. If it's coming from a source where it's been farmed, doesn't have the right omega content, it's just not the same food. They really need to be wild fish eggs. Now we're going to take a look at some of the oils that we've got on this list. So we've got butter, coconut oil, and olive oil. Butter, for me, very easy, straight in S tier, probably not surprised, animal product, what did you think was going to happen? Really good source of saturated fat, really good source of cholesterol. Actually, one really interesting thing about butter is it contains butyrate, butyric acid. This is a short chain fatty acid that we're supposed to produce in our intestines. When we break down fibers through the fermentation process, we produce these short chain fatty acids, which are beneficial for our gut health. They feed the lining of the intestine. Butter is literally one of the only sources of butyric acid. It can be really helpful for your gut as well. Coconut oil, also an amazing food. I wouldn't put it in S tier. The edge that butter has is that it has saturated fat. Coconut oil also has saturated fat. But because butter is an animal product, it's much higher in the fat-soluble vitamins, particularly vitamin A, vitamin D, and vitamin K2. Coconut oil, being a plant fat, doesn't have any of those. It does have vitamin E, which is an essential nutrient. But vitamin E, I personally don't think it's that important. Vitamin A, D, and K2, far, far more important. So butter's going in S tier. Coconut oil is a saturated fat, so it's still really good. Also, it's 50% MCTs. MCTs are medium chain triglycerides. And again, super big nerd, I actually know what they are. This is caprylic, caproic, and capric acid. So the thing that's really cool about MCTs is that you don't need bile to digest them. They'll literally just absorb straight into your body and your body can use them in the same way that your body uses ketones. The other half of coconut oil is lauric acid, which is disputed. Some people consider it an MCT, others consider it a long chain fat. But what's really interesting to note is that once in your gut, the lauric acid can actually turn into something called monolaurin, which is one of the primary ingredients in breast milk. So this has immune stimulating effects. Think about how breast milk influences a baby's digestive system. You can get some of those benefits as an adult by taking coconut oil. It's absolutely amazing. Honestly, I'm even considering putting it up here in S tier. It is really, really good, but I think it just doesn't make it and it's gonna stay in A tier. But very solid food. Coconut oil, amazing. Olive oil. I actually would put olive oil just below coconut oil. It's still very good. It's not a saturated fat. It's got very little saturated fat in it, but it's primarily monounsaturated fats, which means it's still safer to cook with. These two are better, or for cooking with butter, generally you'd want to use ghee because ghee doesn't have any of those milk proteins which can make it burn. But both of these being saturated fat means that they're more stable to cook with. Olive oil, you can get away with it, especially for shorter cook times and if you're only using the oil once. If you're refrying, if you're cooking something multiple times, you definitely want to be using a saturated fat. But for cooking some, let's say you're cooking some liver in the pan or you're cooking some fish in the pan or an egg, using some extra virgin olive oil isn't a bad choice, but coconut oil and butter is probably better. Now we're down to the final eight. And I really feel like, you, you tell me if you think I'm wrong, but I really feel like every food that's in the S and the A tiers, they've really had to fight their way into those tiers. I don't think I've given any free passes today. I think I've been pretty ruthless in keeping S and A tier as clear as I can. But we have some amazing foods here. We really have some amazing superfoods. But saying that, I'm gonna take another food and I'm gonna stick it up in S tier, and it's kefir. So it has to be an S tier. It's basically almost the same nutritionally as butter. It has a slightly lower fat content, but it's a fermented food. And fermented food's absolutely amazing. We don't have any other fermented foods. Oh, we do actually, we have apple cider vinegar down here. But fermented foods, generally absolutely amazing. Kefir, the reason I chose kefir over other things like, let's say, kimchi or sauerkraut is the fact that the dosage of probiotics that you're gonna get with kefir 
are significantly higher than that of yogurt or sauerkraut or kimchi. And also the reason that it's it's, it's beating natto, because natto is also a fermented food, natto has the bacillus species organisms in, which are soil-based organisms. They're non-colonizing. The reason kefir is going in S tier is it contains beneficial lactobacillus and bifidobacterium organisms, which are colonizing, which means they're going to take up residence and live inside your digestive system. It also contains beneficial yeasts, which I believe kefir is one of the only foods that does this. And beneficial yeasts are particularly antagonistic to pathogenic yeasts, like candida. And the key to a healthy microbiome is diversity. So the fact that you get so much diversity in kefir, we could be talking up to 55 or 60 different strains of bacteria and yeast. Kefir definitely deserves a place in S tier. I think while we're here, we'll also get the other final fermented food that we have here, being apple cider vinegar and it has to go in s it really does i feel kind of bad putting so many things in s tier after just saying i've worked so hard to guard s and a tier and not put too many things in here but hear me out because it really does deserve its place here first of all fermented food so that's giving it points already the second thing is because it's made from apples and it's fermented it's very high in a substance called malic acid Malic acid is a very powerful substance in the human body. It helps to break down kidney stones and bile stones. So if you have any kind of gallbladder problems, liver congestion, kidney stones, this can be really powerful. The fact that it's also a vinegar means it's very high in acids. So this works amazingly as a digestive stimulant, both for the stomach and the stomach acid, but also as a digestive bitter to help with bile secretions and promoting liver health. And finally, because it's a fermented food, it's not only got probiotics, but it's also full of enzymes. So it's supporting the pancreas and the other digestive functions in your body. So digestive wise, absolutely phenomenal. Final benefit is the fact that as it is a vinegar, it contains acetic acid. Acetic acid supports the body's ability to regulate blood sugars. So if you have this in a salad before you have your main meal with pizza or pasta or anything that's fairly high in carbohydrates it can reduce the blood sugar spike by between 15 and 25 percent it allows the sugars to be taken into the cells through a mechanism independent of insulin so this can also protect you against high blood sugars diabetes pre-diabetes and it can help to lower your hemoglobin a1c so absolutely phenomenal food really hard not to put it anywhere other than s tier it's it's just too good it's tricky because the foods that we've got left, they're all pretty good. So let's go with something that isn't going to quite make it. Let's go with avocados. Now, I love avocados. They're a high FODMAP food, so they're a good source of fiber. They're a good source of fat as well. You know, there's only so much coconut oil you can eat off of a spoon. And there's only so much fat that you can put in your meals. You know, especially if you're doing a lower carb or ketogenic diet. So I think we're going to put it in B tier. As far as polyphenols go, it's not the strongest. But it's a really solid source of dietary fat. And really, as far as plant dietary fats, you've kind of really only got olives and avocados. And we've already got olive oil up here. So I think avocados really deserve their place in B tier. Definitely not what I would consider a superfood, but a pretty solid option for a nice staple in your diet. Now we've got a beverage. We're going to do matcha green tea. I really don't want to put it in B tier. I want to put it down here. But when I look at what it's compared to, B tier is its home. There are some really powerful plant compounds, polyphenols, in green tea. Very powerful antioxidant effects. Very powerful benefits with regards to cognition. And I think one reason I'm putting it here is it's a beverage. So you can drink it throughout the day. And also, as far as caffeine goes, it's actually a really nice source of caffeine. I can't believe that I didn't put coffee on here. I do actually think coffee would deserve a similar place, maybe here in B tier as well. But as far as caffeine, you know, if you're going to choose green tea or a monster energy drink or a Red Bull, green tea, unquestionably better. And I think I'm going to put cacao here next to it. I think with cacao, it's actually quite fair to put coffee because cacao and coffee are actually fairly similar. Some really powerful, beneficial, primarily polyphenols and antioxidant substances. A lot of people say that cacao can be a good source of magnesium. But again, it's a kind of higher in oxalate. I don't really know how much weight I put on plants being good sources of nutrients. So I'm not putting it in B tier for that reason. I'm putting it here more because, well, one, it tastes amazing. Who doesn't like chocolate? Like, you have to be crazy if you don't like chocolate. But also, there are significant polyphenol benefits to 
especially raw cacao if you can get it and also good quality coffee coffee is actually really powerful i think a lot of people kind of feel guilty that they have coffee and they think like it's something they're doing that's really bad for their health but as long as you don't have a caffeine addiction you know as long as you're if you can go for two or three days without having coffee and you don't feel any worse for it i actually think coffee is a very healthy food well drink and you should enjoy it and don't feel so guilty about it so if i had coffee on here i'd stick it here with cacao in beat it we're down to the final three we've got beans and legumes medicinal mushrooms and seaweed where do you think they're going medicinal mushrooms gonna have to put them in s tier so in this category i've included things like reishi chaga turkey tail cordyceps all of these different types of mushrooms that generally aren't consumed for the sake of like you know like the white button mushrooms that you'd put in your stir fry you know these are more medicinal mushrooms the reason they go in s tier is most of them are adaptogenic which means the way they affect your body is going to be different from how they affect somebody else's body they collaborate and communicate with your hormonal system with your immune system and they're going to have a different effect depending on what you need they're also amazing sources of some of the most powerful antioxidants that we know and mushrooms they're not animals they're not plants they're in this weird space in between and reflecting that are the fact that they contain other substances like specific types of prebiotics that you don't get in other things but also they're very specific polyphenolic compounds have very profound impacts in the human body many of them are very powerful modulators of the immune system of the hormonal system and a lot of them also show benefits with anti-cancer properties anti-dementia and alzheimer neuroprotective effects they reduce and prevent hepatotoxicity so they protect the liver from harm they're absolutely phenomenal and again the key here as with so this we have this grouping of medicinal mushrooms just as we had this grouping of berries and this grouping of green herbs that you could probably grow in your garden the key is the variety if you took the variety out they'd probably come down a point the same for the berries and for the green herbs but the variety is the key the variety is the strength so if you can try and get a variety of these different benefits that's what really keeps them their space in s tier we're going to do the seaweed and we're going to save the beans and legumes until last seaweed i want to put in s tier no nope, not s tier a tier seaweed's going in a tier seaweed really is an amazing source of iodine it's probably the best source of iodine of all things that you could possibly eat and if you don't have enough iodine your body's going to really struggle to function properly your thyroid functions using two molecules t3 and t4 and the reason they're called t3 and t4 is t3 is three molecules of iodine and t4 is four molecules of iodine if you don't have the raw ingredients your thyroid isn't going to work and if your thyroid doesn't work your thyroid is like the thermostat for your whole body your whole metabolism will shut down if your thyroid doesn't work which means your digestive system doesn't work your immune system doesn't work your detoxification systems don't work basically your whole body is just going to slow down and shut down and it isn't going to work and the reason that seaweed is such a good source of iodine is it's extracting the iodine from the oceans where we have mineral depleted soils we, we're missing these trace minerals now the oceans are still full of them so seaweed an amazing source of iodine now i'm thinking about it i'm actually thinking i want to put it in b tier it's an amazing food but when i'm looking at like red meat raw honey natto turmeric i don't think it deserves to be there it is uh, is still a very very powerful food I, it's on the edge of being a superfood but i don't think it quite makes it maybe a bit of a shocker for you but bringing it down from a to b and finally we have beans and legumes and this is a mix of all different beans and legumes this is chickpeas this is kidney beans this is mung beans this is lentils i'm gonna say that these have to be prepared correctly if they're not prepared d tier unquestionably they need to be soaked they need to be sprouted they need to be prepared correctly but if all of these things are done and these foods are prepared correctly i actually want to put them in a tier and that's probably going to shock you but hear me out i've got really good reason i was doing some research recently and it was showing that beans are like nature's cleaners in our intestines one of the most important parts of our detoxification systems is the fact that our bile drains into our small intestine it moves all the way through our small intestine and then exits in our stool and this bile contains toxins this is how the fat soluble toxins leave now it's really important that we have not only the correct microbes but also the correct fibers in the gut to 
support and enable this detoxification process. And one of the best ways we can do this, actually one of the best ways we can do both of these things is with beans and legumes. And again, the variety is the key. Generally speaking, beans and legumes are one of the highest sources of FODMAPs in the diet, but they also contain many other substances that behave as binders. They act like binders. They're what allows us to keep those toxins that are excreted in the bile in the stool. Because if this doesn't happen, then the alternative is that the bile is reabsorbed back into the body and it's still full of toxins. And if this happens, your liver is literally running on a treadmill. It's working so hard to try and detoxify your body and the toxins are just coming straight back in. So one of the best ways we can support that is the correct fibers in the gut and the correct microbes in the gut. And beans and legumes are a really great way of doing that if prepared correctly. So that's it, we're done. How do you feel looking at this list? I want you to, as you look at this list, just think about what you eat on a daily basis. I want you to think, how many of these foods from the S and the A tier are you consuming? And based on the information that I've shared with you in this video, what changes do you think you're gonna be making to your diet? Leave me a comment and let me know below because I know that this video was packed with information, but I really like to know what you walked away with today. Because although I had a blast making this video, it did take me a massive chunk out of my day. And I did so because I really want to help you. I really want you to make better informed decisions. I want you to feel like you've got all the information at your fingertips so that you can make healthy choices, so that you can have the health outcomes that you want. So let me know. I really love to hear from you after you've watched one of my videos. If you watch to the end, what I actually want you to do is leave me an emoji of one of these foods in S tier. Leave me an emoji of an egg. Leave me an emoji of a fish. Leave me an emoji of a mushroom. Just so that I know you watched this video all the way through to the end, because this was a bit of a long one, and I know it was super densely packed with information. I'm always trying to keep my eye out for who's actually watching all the videos all the way to the end. So that's a really nice little way of you letting me know that you watched all the way to the end. So leave me a little emoji and let me know what your takeaway is from today's video. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. I do my best to get back to every single one of them. I really genuinely hope you've enjoyed this video. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.